Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to our first online science fair put on by the Girls Initiative. I wanted to take a few moments right off the cuff and thank all of our participants for all of the hard work you put into your projects. I know that with everything going on these days um, and not having access to the normal supports you do at school, doing an independent project like this is really, really tough. And so I know that your mentors are super proud of all the creativity, drive, um, and, and curiosity you put into these projects. So thank you and a big you know, round of applause from all of us at the Girls Initiative. Um, today, we have eight finalists ready to present their projects to our three judges, and I'll introduce them in a few minutes. Um, we Each of the finalists have five minutes to present their projects, and then they have five minutes to respond to questions from our judges. Um, for the finalists watching, while your peers are presenting, consider taking some time to reflect on their presentations and the thought they put into their work and giving them some feedback at the end. So after all of our finalists present, um, the judges will deliberate for half an hour or so and we'll come back on at three o'clock um, to present the winners. And so I'm sure you're all wondering what the prizes are if you haven't remembered. <laughs> so our first place will win a Samsung Chromebook. Our second place um, will win a Learn to Code robot kit. And third place will take home a year subscription to National Geographic. So really exciting stuff. Uh, and now I can introduce our three judges and stop talking hopefully very soon. Um, first off, we have Dr. Julie Vale, Associate Professor and Head of Engineering Systems, Computing and Computer Engineering at the University of Guelph. Uh, and then we have Dr. Christine Speckens, Associate Professor of Astronomy at the Royal Military College of Canada and Queen's University. And we have Dr. Alexander Peterson, Adjunct Professor of Geography and Business Development Officer at the Arthur B. McDonald Canadian Astroparticle Physics Research Institute, which is a mouthful. <laughs> so I know that our judges here have taken some time and read our finalists' reports. Um, so I just wanted to open the floor and see if the judges had anything they wanted to say to our finalists before they present. I'm really excited to see all of your presentations. Uh, I read all of the reports. There's some amazing stuff in here. Um, all of you amazing young women who are going to come forward and be scientists and engineers and discoverers and inventors. Uh, I can't wait to see you, what you do in your future lives. Awesome. Yeah, big congratulations from me um, on completing all these great projects. Uh, lots of work, lots of um, ingenuity and creativity. I'm really looking forward to hearing your presentations. Thanks, too, to everyone for the hard work that you put into your projects. They were wonderful, wonderful reports to read, and I'm so excited to see your presentations today. As my colleagues have said before me, you are all very bright and inspiring young women, so we're excited to see what you do in the future. Yeah, I'll just echo those comments, and I'm, I'm really just looking forward to hearing what, uh, what you've come up with, your ideas and your discoveries. So with that, um, we'll just get started right away. First up, we have Ava Elliott in grade seven, and she'll talk about her own project.
How to prevent viruses in long-term care homes. This study is gonna be about how we can prevent the spread of a virus in a long-term care home. There are small things long-term care homes can do to prevent the spread of a virus from spreading and causing as much harm as COVID-19 has. Some things long-term care homes can do are to replace things that people usually touch that a virus can live on, such as door handles and light switches. These things can be replaced with motion sensors. So staff and residents in long-term care homes don't have to touch things that a possible virus can live on and they have a chance of getting infected. Long-term care homes can also use heat mapping, a device to show where a virus is and if they need to do anything such as isolating a resident to prevent a virus from spreading any further. When doing this, there will be less outbreaks and deaths in, the lo in long-term care homes and infections such as the common cold and flu will go down because the virus can't live in the home. So the overall goal of this study is to prevent the spread of a virus from spreading in long-term care homes. This study is meant to to prevent a virus or a disease in long-term care homes. This is important because we can find ways to protect the elderly. My hypothesis is that if long-term care homes can do simple things such as installing motion sensors to operate things a virus could live on, such as doorknobs, more hand cleaning stations to promote hand cleaning and heat mapping, it will prevent a virus from spreading any further. My study aims to protect residents and the staff in long-term care homes. And my study will also go in depth in different ways a long-term care home can protect their residents. Canada has the highest proportion of deaths in long-term care home settings among 14 countries. According to the study by the International Long-Term Care Policy Network, by May 2nd, long-term care homes, COVID-19 deaths have made up for 62% of Canada's COVID-19 deaths. And by May 6th, there had been 223 outbreaks and that number is only expected to rise. Before we had this virus, people already thought long-term care home infection disease prevention was lacking. There has been lots of virus and outbreaks in long-term care homes, such as respiratory illnesses that happen in long-term care homes during the fall and early spring and other diseases that usually affect the elderly or any other people with chronic illness. One of, the, one of the major outbreaks is SARS, which happened in 2003. Long-term care homes are doing did the same thing they're doing now, making sure residents isolate, wear a mask and washing their hands. Products that can be used, motion sensors. Motion sensors are a great tool because motion sensors can be used to replace things a virus can live on, such as door handles. And most sensors are not that expensive. They range from 30 to $100. Hand cleaning station. If you have multiple hand cleaning stations in a long-term care home, it will promote hand cleaning because residents and staff will see them often and will remind them to wash their hands. Heat mapping. Heat mapping can be used to see where a virus in a long-term care home is. And it has been used in multiple big companies such as Whole Foods and countries like Australia. So in this project, I researched what long-term care homes can do to prevent a virus or infections from living in a long-term care home. My hypothesis is that if long-term care homes can do simple things such as installing motion sensors to operate things that a virus could live on, like doorknobs and more hand cleaning stations to promote hand cleaning, it will prevent a virus from spreading any further. When researching the, on the subject, some things I looked at were, what are other countries with a high elderly population like Japan and Sweden are doing to protect the elderly? And what simple things can a long-term care home do, such as making sure staff in the home are wearing masks when seeing a resident who is sick so that illness doesn't spread. So some of the results I have found is a virus will not be able to live in a home because if a home has good, a good cleaning solution, it won't be able to live on a surface as a, such as a table 
because if the hand cleaning solution will disinfect it and hand sanitizer in multiple places will promote hand cleaning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ava. That was really, really informative. Um, so I think we're gonna take a second and just try to switch over so all of our judges can come back and ask you a few questions. Okay. All right, so, so we have everyone back on here. Um, does anyone, is anyone dying to go first? I'm happy to take the first, first leap and thank Ava for your presentation. You're so clear in what you're saying to us in your presentation and your, um, I like the confidence in your voice when you're talking to us about what's going on and, and your project in general. My first question is just about what inspired you for this project. What was interesting to you um, like, and why you picked this topic for your report? I picked this topic for my report because this is a big problem in society and some evidence to support that was the study from the long-term care policy network saying that Canada had the highest amount of deaths in a long-term care home setting among 14 countries. And I think we as a society can fix that problem. That's phenomenal. I'm so glad that you picked a really current problem and you've come up with this great solution. I, I hope you share that with some long-term care homes. I think they could use your advice. Thank you. Hi, Ava. I'd like to follow up on Alexandra's question a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm curious about whether or not you researched Canadian or Ontario long-term care homes to find out whether or not they are already doing these things and which ones are and which ones aren't or how many? Yes, I did research into some long-term care homes in Ontario to see what they were doing. I found that a lot of them, since they have staffing structures, they are doing minimum but I feel like it, more can be done. Okay, thank you very much. Hi there, Ava. Um, to follow up on Alexander and Julie's questions, um, you mentioned heat mapping as a, a really effective way to understand where the virus is in a long-term care home and that some countries like Japan and Australia had used that very effectively um, have you thought about how long-term care homes in Ontario would, would make a heat map? What kind of data would they use and how would they share that data with the right people? I think long-term care homes, they need to use like how many people are dying of an illness and use that type of data. How many people are getting sick from certain infections? and use that as part of their data. Great, thanks. All right, do we have any follow-up questions from our judges? No? Okay, I have a question, Ava, if you don't mind. Um, how do you feel after this project? I feel really good. Awesome, <laughs> that's what we wanna hear. <laughs> I think you should be really proud. That's a lot of work. And um, I was really impressed at how you sourced your information and um, how you decided to go about your study. So well done, well done. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, next up we have Valerie Sun and she's in grade six. So we're gonna pause for a second just so we can get her uh, on the feed.
Hello there, my name is Valerie Sun. I'm here to talk about the impact of contextual factors on learning and memory. This research explores the potential effect of shared connections between learning stimuli and the background on memory. I wanted to find out whether a connection could be made between an object to learn and the context in which it was to be learned. Two studies were conducted to test this. I discovered that certain people are capable of making connections between different senses, such as between music notes and color. I wanted to find out whether similar connections could be made between objects to learn and the context in which they were to be learned. Another inspiration came from Pavlovian conditioning, in which dogs were conditioned to respond to certain stimuli by having that stimuli presented immediately before being fed. This experiment is similar to conditioning. I wondered whether these effects could be observed in learning and memory, leading to my prediction. It was predicted that people would learn and memorize better if both learning and testing occurred within similar contexts. For example, with the same musical background or the same visual background. In study one, participants were recruited in person and assigned to one of four conditions. These conditions included learning and testing with music, the connection condition, learning only with music, testing only with music, and neither learning nor testing with music, the control condition. Each condition was run as a separate session. During each session, participants received study guides. The topic study was, was violas. Depending on the condition, the music would either play or not during the studying and or testing phases. After 15 minutes of independent studying, participants received a 15 minute lunch break, after which they had 30 minutes of testing. As predicted, the connection group had the highest average score. On the other hand, the group of the music during studying had the lowest average score. There is an alternative explanation. There may have been individual differences among different conditions <clears throat> due to pre-existing knowledge and differences in motivation. To address both of these concerns in study two, an artificial language was used and each participant went through each condition. Study two was conducted online. Participants first gave their consent after which the details of the experiment were summarized. Participants would next be introduced to the learning task where they learned artificial words with or without a background for seven seconds. Then participants would be directed to a distraction task of describing three different images for four and a half minutes. Once this was completed, they would begin the testing phase where they were asked for the English translation of each word they had previously learned, with or without a background, given three possible choices. Overall, participants learned 32 artificial words in a random order. <clears throat> These 32 artificial words were divided into four different blocks or conditions, these being learning and testing with a background, the connection condition, learning only with a background, testing only with a background, and neither learning nor testing with the background, the control condition. The results of study two did not support the hypothesis. Compared to the other conditions, the connection condition did not perform better. Similarly to study one, the group of the background during learning only performed worst. There are several factors that may have affected the results of this experiment, including the background not being salient enough to participants. It was attempted to counterbalance the words by creating two versions of the study in which the conditions were applied to different word lists in order to ensure that it was not the words in the condition affecting the results. There were more than two possible variants that could have been made, but this was not possible due to limited time. Therefore, results may not be as accurate. There was a notable trend throughout both studies. Performance with a background presented during learning only was the poorest. This may have been due to the background distracting participants. If the presence of a background distract while learning distracts participants, then that should apply to the connection condition as well. The fact that participants in the connection condition perform much better suggests that being tested with the same background cancels out the distraction effect. The results of the two studies were inconclusive. Study one supported the hypothesis while study two did not. Several extensions would refine the quality of the experiments. For example, it would be informative to see whether the results would generalize to other genres of music or backgrounds. As well, a larger sample size may show results that reflect the population more reliably. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Hi, Valerie. Thank you so much for that really informative presentation. Um, before we have any questions, I just really wanted to say I'm, I'm, I'm impre impressed with uh, the study design you put together, how you control for outside variables, and it's very clear that you took a lot of thought um, behind designing the study. Uh, I really, I'm really, really impressed. So I'll uh, open the floor to our judges. Any questions? I guess 
and I'll go so, first. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, we'll have to take turns. <laughs> go for it. Okay, uh, Valerie, I was really, really impressed by uh, your presentation. Um, as Kelly said, you've done a very careful experimental design. You've gone to the extent of actually designing a second experiment to validate the first. Um, well done, very, very well done. Um, I have a bunch of questions because I'm curious. <laughs> you've piqued my curiosity, but I'm gonna limit myself to one so that my, my uh, colleagues can have a chance to also ask some questions. Um, how did you come up with the idea to use a fake language as a way of helping to control? Well, initially when I was designing study two, um, I just, well, as mentioned in the presentation, um, the pre-existing knowledge might have been a factor that affected the results in study one. And as a result, I wanted to use something that nobody else but me would have known. Therefore, I created an artificial language um, because I wanted something that participants would l learn how to do with no prior knowledge at all. Um, and that's more or less the inspiration behind using an artificial language. Cool, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I could go next. Um, congratulations, that was a, a really great presentation and some, uh, some really thoughtful experimental design and uh, I, I think your results are really interesting. Um, I noticed that the age ranges of the participants in study one and study two was a little bit different. And I'm wondering if you thought a little bit about whether that might have influenced some of the results. Could that maybe explain why um, the, the, the hypo your first experiment um, agreed with your hypothesis and the second one didn't? I did consider that, yeah. Um, the reason the age ranges were different was just because study two was conducted online and most of my participants were recruited for social through social media and as a result, there wasn't really any filter I could use. So right. anyone who could see my account was able to participate. Yeah, that would be, um, I, I liked your recommendation of, of um, making your sample size larger. When, when you have more um, respondents, then you can start to do things like control for age, right? And only pick the, the 12 year olds maybe and, and look at their responses, for example. Uh, great job again, thanks. Thank you so much, Valerie. I really enjoyed this presentation. You've done an excellent job, again, as my colleagues have stated, of, of designing your experiment as well as implementing it. And I'm really impressed with how many people you got through your, um, your social media posts. And that was actually going to be my question is, how did you recruit so many people? But it seems like you've been really smart about leveraging your, your presence online and uh, making sure that you connect with lots of friends that are there. Um, I, I just wanted to hear a little bit more from you now that I'm thinking about a new question um, about, about that future study. If you could do something differently than what you did in this current experiment, what would you do differently in the next experiment? That's a good question. Um, well, hmm. I did mention before that a possible factor that affected the results was the background in study two not being salient enough to participants because um, I don't know if you saw, but as I was explaining the design, I showed example images for what participants were seeing as they learned the language. However, the background itself, it wasn't very noticeable. Like it, it was, yeah, because because in study one, um, the music was something that everyone noticed. Whereas in study two, there might have been some people who just weren't motivated enough for something to pay attention to it. So maybe a background that would, um, that participants would pay more attention to. Perhaps something more distracting, right? Or less distracting, but that's great. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that response. Do we have any other questions from the judges? I got one more because I can't resist. <laughs> um, so this, this area of uh, learning and connecting visual, auditory, and um, written material is, is really richly studied because it's a really cool area of, of research. Um, 
I'm just curious if when you were doing um, any of the, any of your self study around this, did you look into some of that background information? Like there's there's this great stuff that says that if you if you say touch your head, you can really mess people up, <laughs> right? <laughs> While you're touching your nose, <laughs> or you, put up, you put up a picture that's on a green black background, but it says blue, and say what color? <laughs> you know, like there's there's really neat stuff like that out there. And I was curious about whether or not you had the opportunity to um, to look at any of those things. Yeah, in general, I did do a lot of research around that area. Um, it's a pretty broad field, so mm -hmm. there's nothing really in specific that I can pinpoint, but I did look into that, yeah. Did you find anything in particular that you thought was like particularly neat or funny or interesting in, in that area? Um, hmm. uh, at the moment, I can't really think of anything, but. <laughs> That's fine. It's sometimes it's really hard when you get put on the spot like this. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you again, Valerie. Um, it's, it's clear that you know so much about this topic. You speak really clearly and passionately as well about your design. And um, yeah, that was really cool to watch. Thanks again. Okay. Um, up next, we have Rachel Urquhart. She's in grade eight. Uh, so again, we'll just pause the screen for a second just to get her online. Um, and uh, yeah, here she comes. Hello, my name is Rachel Urquhart, and I am a grade eight student at Arantara Elementary School. I did my project on understanding the immune system and COVID-19. Abstract. COVID-19 is a global pandemic. Currently, there are no vaccines for COVID-19, so our best defense against this disease is our immune system. However, not everyone knows exactly what the immune system is doing to fight it off. This project investigates the immune system response to COVID-19 in the body. It also looks at how the immune system and the nervous system interact. To give a visual understanding of the immune system, I made a model to show how the adaptive immune response works. Since we know the importance of keeping people informed about the current situation on this pandemic, I decided to create pamphlets based on the research that I did as part of this science fair. Introduction. The main defense in our bodies to fight off disease is the immune system. The immune system it is mainly composed of organs and cells with a specific function. Our immune system has two main responses, innate and adaptive. The innate immune response is nonspecific. It has no memory and is the body's first line of attack to a pathogen to get rid of sickness quickly. The innate immune system includes of physical barriers such as skin, saliva, mucus, as well as general immune response such as inflammation. The adaptive immune response remembers specific pathogens and how to get rid of them. It takes longer to develop in our bodies. B and T cells are the main cells that participate in the adaptive immune response. B cells make antibodies that bind to a specific antigen and T cells destroy the antigens that the antibodies identify. The nervous system. 
The nervous system consists of the brain, spinal cord, and nerves and helps the body communicate. It can help the immune system identify self and non-self cells. The automatic nervous system consists of the sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, and the parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest. The parasympathetic nervous system communicates with the immune system to maintain homeostasis in the body. Knowing strategies to, to activate the parasympathetic nervous system helps manage stress and stay healthy. Some strategies are deep breathing, coloring, humming, listening to music, and rest. The objective. In this project, I want to understand how the immune memory works and if many antibodies are better, better at fighting pathogens than just a few. With this model, using salt grains as cells, iron filings as pathogens, and magnetic tape as antibodies, I will be able to understand this process. Hypothesis. The more antibodies we will use, the stronger the immune response will be. This is a list of the materials used to create my model. Um, these pictures illustrate the steps I followed to complete the model. Results. In table one and figure one, you can see the collected data through my trials. Over the total, you can see that more antibodies together did better than antibody one, two, and three alone. Results. For each antibody, I inverted the jar the same amount of times. I used the same jar with the same iron filings and salt for each antibodies. Based on these observations and the data collected, I was able to demonstrate that there are more antibodies that put into the immune system, the more pathogens they removed. For most of the tr tests, trial two and three collected more pathogens than trial one. The model showed that the antibodies were effective at capturing the pathogens and left the other cells alone. Conclusion, this model shows that more antibodies collect more pathogens. The model also demonstrates that when you're sick or exposed to a pathogen, it's better to have as many antibodies as possible to help fight off the pathogens. I also observed using this model that the antibodies are specific and can recognize self from non-self. They were able to remove most of the pathogens shown as iron filings and left the human cells, the salt, alone. Application. Based on the information that I learned about the immune system and the nervous system in COVID-19, I created a pamphlet to share this information with others. It's called Learn About COVID-19 and Stop the Spread. The pamphlet includes information on COVID-19, how you can protect yourself, some, factors about the, some facts about the nervous system, and how to strengthen the immune system. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I am. I have some questions, but I'm going to take it off to the judge first. Um, but I'm really curious, so I hopefully they ask my question. <laughs> All right, any of the judges? Sure, I can go first. Um, great presentation, Rachel. I, I really enjoyed your experiment. I thought the um, the the way that you chose to represent um, the different elements in a human system um, with physical objects that you could find um, was really creative and I enjoyed that. Um, and I, I think your, your conclusion that um, more antibodies um, capture more pathogens is, is a, a really important one. Um, I was wondering if you could say something about how, or if you've thought about how much more pathogens you catch with more antibodies. So if you put twice the magnets in, do you catch twice the pathogens or do you catch four times the pathogens? Did, did you try to quantify how much better you did when you put more antibodies? Um, when I put more antibodies, it was kind of, they were around the same amount of pathogens that the magnets took out, like removed. But I think it would be like, if you put two more antibodies in, it would be twice the amount of pathogens it was removed. Okay, great. So the more you put in, the more you remove. And um, for each extra antibody you put in, you get that much extra pathogens out. Um, that's called a linear relationship. I don't know if you've heard of that before. Um, but it means if you if you double some if you double the antibodies you double the pathogens that you take out and that's a really interesting thing to measure and I'm sure there are lots of people around the world who are trying to measure that with COVID nineteen in particular. 
great job. Thank you. I'm happy to uh, ask the next question. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, Rachel. This has been a really awesome and educating piece for me. I don't have very much background in my scientific uh, research uh, on this particular topic. So I found your the way in which you translated what you have learned to me very easy for me to understand. And that's a great attribute to have as a science, a scientist for your outreach capacity. I really like too that you made a pamphlet because I think that's a wonderful way to share your information with the public. And my question would be, where would you like this pamphlet to be targeted? Is it for your peers in school? Would you like it to go into long-term care homes? Whereabouts would you like to see the pamphlet end up? Um, I've shared it with a couple of my friends and possibly my teacher might send it out to some teachers at my school to have in their classroom. But it would be cool to have it in like care homes or hospitals. I think that's a great, great initiative. And I hope that you can get that pamphlet out there into the world. Good for you. Thank you. Okay, I guess it's my turn now. Um, I want to follow up on Christine's question about modeling. So um, Christine talked about how you've modeled a linear relationship using uh, your iron filings and, and your magnets. Do you know whether or not the immune response has that behavior? Like, did you do some research to determine whether or not this model is, is an appropriate model for the immune system? Yes. Okay, and what, what did that research look like and what did it tell you? Um, I researched how antibodies reacted to specific pathogens and that they um, will most of the time leave other healthy human cells alone, but will also go to the other cells, the pathogens. Do you know if um, antibodies work the same way to all pathogens or if they react differently to different pathogens? Um, some are specific to the path. Some antibodies are specific to the pathogen that they um, kill, but others are non-specific. Okay, and one more follow-up question for you. You mentioned that um, in your report, you mentioned that some salt would come out with the antibody as well. And so you suggested that adding more antibodies will take out more pathogens. Will adding more antibodies maybe take out more salt as well? They may also take out more salt and that would be an autoimmune response. So which is where your um, antibodies are attacking healthy cells. So yourself, which can cause problems, but so do you think maybe there's a balance between saying, I wanna have lots and lots and lots of antibodies in there, no matter what, like, or maybe we want some antibodies, but not too many. What do yeah, you there could probably be a balance in there. I would have to look into it more. Cool, this is, uh, this is super neat project. Thank you very much for sharing your ideas. I also like the pamphlet, I just wanted to say. <laughs> I just wanted to say a few things. Um, that last answer, Rachel, is excellent. Um, I'd have to look into it more is a great way to answer a question you're not entirely sure of as a scientist. It's very honest. Um, and I think you'll find as you progress through your career as a scientist that the way you speak to people and the way you convey information is as important as the science you're doing because it allows other people to know all the cool stuff you're doing. So uh, yeah, I. I'm thrilled with your pamphlet. And if it's all right with you, I'd love to be able to share it through the Girls Initiative as well. Okay, yes. that's great. Um, so thank you again. That was really, really wonderful. Um, and up next, I'll just pull up my list. We have uh, Cole Shanks and he's in grade seven. So again, we'll pause the feed and we'll bring him on.
Hello, my name is Cole and I live in Abbotsford, BC. My goal was to be able to come up with a cheap water filter because a big problem to this day is that not everybody has access to clean water or the materials to purify water. An estimated 790 million people are, or around 11% of our population are without access to an improved water supply. I really wanted to make a cheap filter, seeing how a lot of solutions cost lots of money, but a lot of people in need of a filter can't afford it. So my idea was to use limited resources and make a cheap working water filter. The materials used for this project were two bins, grass clippings, gravel, sand, and charcoal. The steps we were using the scissors and two holes to the bottom of the filter bin, add gravel to the tall bin for the filter, then add charcoal to the top of the gravel, add sand on top of the charcoal, and lastly add fresh grass clippings on top of the sand. Then place the second bin underneath the bin with all the materials, add dirty water and let it filter to the next bin, and if needed, filter it again. After pouring the water through the after pouring the water through the filter, the, the water emerged visibly cleaner. This is because the particles were trapped in the materials in the filter. The charcoal and sand were able to catch the small particles, and the grass and grass and gravel caught the big particles. Because of this process, the water was able to purify the water, which can be seen in the picture. My hypothesis was correct because the filter changed dirty water to clean drinking water. In particular, charcoal was able to trap even the smallest particles. In conclusion, I wanted to build a filter so that people in need of clean water can have access to have access at a low cost. There are also benefits to the environment. For example, growing at the extra vegetation needed for the filter can help with insect habitats. I expected the big branches to get stuck in the rocks and the little particles to get stuck in the charcoal and sand. I believe that charcoal would trap the, the little particles because it exerts attractive forces on the other molecules in the water that we want to filter out. To build my filter, I put gravel, charcoal, sand, and grass clippings in a bin, then pour dirty water into the filter. The rocks and grass caught the big stuff, and the charcoal and sand caught the small particles. This worked very well because after filtering the water, it was vis visually cleaner. I learned that you really can build a filter with limited resources at a low cost, and all you need is two bins, grass clippings, charcoal, gravel, and sand. I recommend getting freshly picked grass clippings and not grass with any dirt on it, or it will not filter. Also, never add too much sand, and if you do, layer it with charcoal or remove some sand. Also, do not put sand at the bottom of the filter or the water will taste like sand. Thanks to Queen's you, to all of the judges, and to everyone who's watching this for setting up this amazing online science fair even during the pandemic. Now, are there any questions? Thank you so much, Cole. That was really wonderful. Um, again, like always, I'll, I'll let the judges ask the first questions, um, but uh, that was really, really clear and I really enjoyed listening to the presentation. Thank you. Okay, I'll go first on this one because this felt like an engineering project to me and I'm an engineer. <laughs> um, so Again, I man, you guys are all so awesome. I have so many things I want to know from you. <laughs> I'll, I'll pick the first thing that I wrote down. So you've done a really neat water purification process where you've gone through and you've removed the particulate from the water. 
Is this the only dangerous thing that's in water? Um, there are also like bacteria and there could be like sort of stuff that will make you sick and even could bring you to the hospital and have some severe damage. Okay, so do you know if your filter is also taking those things out or if it's just taking out the particulate? I ran it through some water filters and I mean some filter strips and it said that they were gone. So I'm pretty sure it trapped them. Okay, do you know if there was any of that, like the dangerous viruses and stuff in the water before you ran it through your filter? I did not do that, but I, now I will do that next time I do this. <laughs> right. So I happen to work at the University of Guelph, which is really famous for doing water resources engineering stuff. And so what you're describing is super cool because that's the kind of work that we do. Um, so water does need two stages of filtration. What you've done is an excellent job of removing the large particulate, but that second phase of the viruses has to be done in a different way. So that's super cool what you've done. I have one really quick follow-up question if my other judges don't mind. I want to know why grass? <laughs> um, it's vegetation. Because we were trying to use limited resources and I did some research and it is pretty good at catching the big stuff. Also with the vegetation, it can be pretty good at catching some of the little particles. Cool, thank you very much. I'm happy to go next. Thank you, Cole, so much for your great presentation. I thought that this was a wonderful, wonderful way to illustrate um, both, you know, the resources that you had to do the project with as well as um, you know the applications for it and there was a, a topic that you discussed at the very beginning of your presentation about the importance of water for people and that there are lots of different communities that need to have clean water have you thought about the application of where you would like to see these filters put um a lot of places like nigeria and places that don't really have the resources or money to afford good like store-bought filters. So I want people to maybe use these there because then they can find those resources that they need for this filter when they're there. I think that's great, Cole. If I may also have my follow-up. Is that something you want to call it? Uh, because I, I think you're totally right. I think that there's lots of countries around the world that could totally benefit from the work that you're doing and, and building these filters. Do you think there's anywhere in Canada where people could use clean water? Um, I think there probably is, but I didn't get to research into that. But I'll have to look into that too. Yeah. Next steps. Good for you, Cole. Well done. Thank you. All right, my, my turn to ask a question. Um, Cole, before I started, I, I, I did just want to give you huge kudos for carrying out uh, an experiment and for setting, um, working out how to work out an experimental setup and actually carry out, um, carry out an experiment, um, especially with all the restrictions that were going on um, while you were trying to do this. It's, it's um, not only is it a great idea, but you demonstrated a whole bunch of creativity to actually pull an experiment off. And a lot of us now who do this for a living are really struggling with exactly what you managed to do um, because uh, as resources get limited, um, it gets harder and harder to do the kind of thing you did. So congratulations. Um, I My question had to do with the um, uh, thinking about the, the relative usefulness of rocks and grass and charcoal and sand. So suppose you had to do away with one of those four things for whatever reason, maybe you were in a place that had no grass, for example, or you, you couldn't, uh, the, the sand and the charcoal were so heavy that you could only afford to transport one um, to a remote location. Which, which of those things do you think you would drop first if you could only use three things instead of four? Um, 
I would probably say you could drop the grass clippings because mostly what they're doing is catching the big particles and sticks and stones. But there's also the rocks that are doing that. So I think you would be you could do it without grass. Yeah, and that, that's really important. Um, if if uh, in the context of some of the questions um, from my colleagues, right? If you some of the places that you you mentioned that um, would really use could really use a system like this. I think you mentioned Nigeria, for example. There are lots of places in Nigeria where, for example, grass doesn't grow very well, right? And so thinking about how important all of the different components of your filter are was probably a, a great way to start thinking about how to adapt it to the particular environments where you're trying to deploy the filter. Um, so I think that, um, so, so there's some really interesting next steps there, right? To think about not only what you'd put in your filter, but how much and what the relative amounts are. And you could really tailor something like this to the particular place where you were thinking of putting it. So congratulations again, I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks again, Cole. Um, and again, you were very gracious with your answers and taking advice from our judges. And that's a, that's a really good quality to have, um, but to also remain critical. And I, I think you did a really excellent job. So um, thank you again. Um, before we want move on to our next uh, finalist, I think we're gonna give the judges uh, a five minute break just to maybe get some water and everyone watching as well. Um, so we'll resume in about five minutes with a presentation from Ashley Cunningham, who's in grade eight. All very soon.
Hello, my name is Ashley Cunningham. I'm a grade eight student at Lancaster Drive Public School and I was mentored by Dr. Hannah Dyes. This is my project on an automatic methadone pump to aid opioid addictions, called What's Your Measure? This is my project outline. As you can see, it sort of describes the summary of what I did. There's an optional materials list at the end. There are advantages to this proposal and why it's important right now due to COVID-19. What is methadone? Methadone is a white crystalline water soluble opioid that And I'm so sorry, I can just hear myself. Okay, it's often used for heroin addictions and um, that. And you may be wondering why we're using an opioid to aid an opioid addiction. The reason for this is because there's two types of these types of drugs. There's an agonist like heroin, which will bind with the opioid receptors in your brain and stimulate all the cells. And it will sort of give you that high effect. And then there's an antagonist, which will bind with the opioid receptors in your brain cut out any sort of agonist movement and it won't let anything else in to prevent overdose, fatal overdoses. And then methadone is something called a partial agonist where methadone is sometimes blocks and it sometimes sort of stimulates the cell. So it gives you an easier transition into treatment because you don't go from having everything with heroin to having nothing with methadone. So I think that would really help for treatment overall. Methadone has also shown many reductions in bad tendencies has, and has been cost effective, such as time incarcerated, time unemployed, time dealing drugs, and, and you see all of these graphs, and all of these graphs were got from the International Drug Abuse Canada. And this is my proposal summary. So this, this pump is based off of an insulin pump. It has two parts, by the way. So the pump is based off of an insulin pump. So every eight hours, it will inject your methadone subcutaneously, which means under the skin in a layer of sort of fat. And it, we did every eight hours, so then the withdrawal symptoms, you don't get all of your methadone at once and then feel really bad afterwards. Um, yeah, so then, and then also each injection will take one and a half hours, just from the safe amount that we found for injecting into someone. It also has an ECG connected to a radio transmitter inside of it which will, if it detects any heart abnormalities after taking the methadone, will automatically call a heart a healthcare provider or EMS. It has a miniature naloxone kit, which is an agonist, I mean, an antagonist, sorry. And so then if you do decide to take heroin afterwards, or if you overdose somehow, you can inject yourself with the naloxone and you will save yourself sort of from a fatal overdose. It also has a rechargeable battery pack to prevent, like, so it's more cost effective. And then the second part is a device, is a storage device for about tamper-proof storage for five liters of methadone. And then it also has a charger attached for the pump to recharge the rechargeable batteries. It has a refrigerating aspect to it. So then you don't like grow bacteria inside the methadone that it's storing. These are my blueprints. So like, as you can see, there's, and this is the first part, this is a pump. You can see the screen, the ECG, the ECG pads, the mini naloxone kit. And on the back, you can see the little clips. And on the inside, you can see the radio transmitters, the pumps, the speakers, and all that sort of lovely stuff. I know I'm going over this quite quickly. If you have any questions, I'd be so happy to answer them. Here is a second blueprint for my other part of the pump. So as you can see, there's a big timer. That's for when your next injection, injection will be available to inject into the pump, because you don't want to be able to like press a button and get it injected however many times you want, so you don't abuse it. You can see the chargers, and on the inside, you can see the refrigeration devices. Some advantages to this proposal is that the um, amount of methadone being injected into a patient is taken out of their hands, so they can't abuse it or forget. It's also quite convenient because the current way of methadone treatment is taking a carry, which is a small bottle that you will drink, and you have to go to the pharmacy every day to take that to make sure you don't sell them or abuse them. And with this in your house, I think it would be quite convenient. And it's also injected gradually, so you don't get all of your methadone at once, and then near the end of the day feel really bad because you don't have as much in your system. Current situations. Due to COVID-19, opioid overdoses are through the roof, especially in Canada, because people who are already addicted to heroin or maybe just can't handle being alone, they don't have that support that they need from people around them. So they rely on opioids to sort of feel that feeling again, which is why I think a, a proposal like this could be important in the future if another pandemic happens and it could be important to current states right now. Some future recommendations for my proposal are make it available for multiple treatments for opioid use disorder, such as Suboxone, because all of the math was worked out for methadone, but I feel like it could be switched, so then you can do multiple types of treatment and research into long-term side effects of preservatives. Preservatives 
we, we were thinking about putting that instead, instead of using the refrigeration aspect to maybe make it more cost effective, but there wasn't enough research available to say whether injecting preservatives into people for a long amount of time would be safe. So we, want, we opted for the refrigeration aspect to make sure the harm of the people who might be taking this would like be cut out and they would be safe while taking it. That is my project. Thank you all so much for listening. Here's my bibliography and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ashley. That was really great. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Before I bring in the questions, I just want to say, uh, you know, not only did you take um, a really important uh, social issue that's happening in our country right now, and make it even more relevant with the ongoing pandemic. And I, you know, I think it's really impressive that you came up with this idea and uh, and very clear that there's a need for this type of technology. So really well done. Thank you. All right. Any questions from our judges? Thank you. Okay, I can go again if you want, or Christine, I think it might be your turn. Oh, if, if it's my turn, I, I, uh, I've lost count, but no, I'm happy to go. Um, so uh, Ashley, great job. Um, I, uh, I really enjoyed reading your report. Um, I thought your, your drawings um, were really clear. And as I was looking at each of them in your report, I really had a, um, uh, got the 3D picture that you were trying to paint. And it was also very clear in terms of what components you, you thought you were going to need. Um, I thought um, you, you really took some, the time to think through a lot of different aspects of adapting something that's been used before for in the context of, of diabetes and an insulin pump for a new purpose. So congratulations. Um, my, my question for you is, is um, because of all this, this work, you've thought through lots of different components that you need, um, not only the pump, but also the storage system to, to have. Um, have you thought a little bit about which of the components are maybe easier to get or to cheaper to get or, or and which one of the ones are, are trickier? And in particular, what do you think the trickiest component, if you were to actually build one of these things, which would, what, what part would be the hardest other than sort of getting a controlled substance? Let's, let's ignore that part of it, right? But okay. just like the device. <laughs> okay, so as I mentioned before, there are two parts to this proposal. And I think it depends on who's building it. If there's like a full on team building it, then a lot of these substances would be easier if I, than if I was building it. Because first of all, I can't get access to methadone and probably not a safe <laughs> pack of needles. So it'd be sort of depending on what is what. And I feel like the easiest component maybe to get is I looked into this. So for the exterior of the pump and for the storage device, I decided it needed to be sort of strong so you can't break it, but it needs to be lightweight because you'll be carrying it on you all the time. So I decided with aluminum because it's very strong and it's very lightweight, which is on the uh, materials list, but I already closed the presentation by accident. So <laughs> I will send it to you if I need to. But so I did that and I feel like the trickiest one could to get, especially cost-wise and sort of that is either like the ECG machines, because they'll be a very cost, like very, very expensive, or maybe possibly the like the specifics for the refrigeration in the big storage device, because like you have to get refrigerants, throttling tubes, compressors, and there's a lot of aspects to that. So I feel like those would be the hardest to obtain. Great, thank you. I have burning questions if that's all right. <laughs> if I jump ahead of you. Okay, um, Ashley, well done. You've done an excellent job of, and I'm going to echo both Kelly and Kristen here, um, you've done an excellent job of picking up on a social issue that has largely been ignored during COVID and is something that we in this country have struggled with for a long time, so good for you for keeping socially relevant. Uh, and as well, um, as the business development officer at the McDonald Institute, uh, one of the things that I look for in my work is researchers who are um, adapting and innovating technologies that already exist. And a good example of that that we've seen very recently is the ventilator project through the McDonald Institute where they took an existing ventilator and then brought a lot of people together to see how can we make this better and how can we put it towards saving lives. And so my question to you then, knowing that you know, researchers rarely do things on their own. They often work in big teams and collaborations with people from across disciplines. If you could work with a scientist to see your, um, your project come to reality, what type of scientist would you draw in to help make your pump better? That's a hard question. That is a very good question. Um, oh my God, there's so many. 
There's so many that I love to have review this just to try to make it as good as possible. Um, I'd say either a chemist or an engineer, just to sort of make sure it's all like for the chemist to make sure like if you read their report, you know, there's I'm also injecting a tiny bit of steroids into people to prevent skin irritation like dexamethasone, dexamethasone. Yeah. So maybe to like look over that, see if there's any better solutions, sort of try to make that as safe for the patient as possible. And an engineer, just because I, <laughs> I, I just designed this in my basement. Like I, put, I tried putting a lot, as much thought into it, but I don't have the mind of an engineer. I don't have all the background research. And I feel like if I could have an engineer look into it and sort of make it as good as possible, I feel like it could really turn into something great. That's fantastic. I really like that you you already have identified that you've got lots of different partners that you could be working with to make your project the best it could possibly be. So yeah, keep that collaboration in mind when you have lots of projects, okay? Okay. Good job. So that means it's my turn. And first, I have to correct you on something. You do have the mind of an engineer. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So looking at this and reading this, and you've, you've identified a need, you've identified a problem and you have um, clearly stated what that problem is, and now you've gone off and tried to find a solution. And that is the core and the essence of what an engineer does and how they think, okay? So stop saying those silly things, <laughs> okay? That's my first, that's my first comment, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, secondly, yeah, biomedical engineer would be all over something like this. So. If if you decide to pursue it, then um, I'm sure that there's a lot of people that would love to work with you. So I have an engineering question for you. Okay. So one of the things that um, engineers do in a different way than most other people is we, we try to make sure that we really understand the problem that we're trying to solve. Okay. So one of the things about this problem that a lot of people miss, including really great engineers, is who are the people that you're trying to serve? And so the people that you're trying to serve with a, with a product or a project like this are often from underrepresented communities that might be um, in financially difficult situations. Mm -hmm. and so what that means is that one of the things that you have to have front of mind while you're doing this kind of a design is cost. Yeah. So now that I've given you that background, I want to actually bounce off of one of Christine's ideas, which was... And, and one of the things she actually asked the previous pre presenter, what on this device is not actually really necessary and could be removed in order to have a significant cost reduction? One, two, three things. What can you take off? Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so one of the things I think it would be helpful, but I don't know if it would be completely necessary is on both of the um, two parts of the device, there are speakers. One of them is to alert when the injection into the pump is finished. And one of them is to alert, let's say it detects something really wrong. If you're still conscious, it can hear that. So then you can know to get into a safe area to make sure you're not like in the middle of the street. Um, but I don't think that would necessarily be, well, necessary because like technically you could just like, I already have the screen and I could probably even take that away because you could just like time it on your watch. But I could either have like a little blinking light, which would be way more cost effective, or I could just sort of like let them like tell them, okay, the injection into the pump takes 30 seconds, count to 35 to be make sure and then take your pump out. So I could do something like that instead of having a full on speaker system. And instead of having the screen for the um, bigger device, the storage device, I could take that away and just tell them, okay, every 24 hours you can have this injection or every 15 hours, depending on what your healthcare provider decides. And maybe also the screen again on the other device because tech, if like, let's say something does go wrong and you have an arrhythmia or you like have heart abnormalities after you take the methadone or you overdose, you, A, you would probably feel the symptoms and probably know it. And B, if someone does come and help you, they would probably be able to see, find, hook you up to stuff to see your heart rate. So they could hook you up to other things. So you wouldn't necessarily have to see it yourself, which would take quite a bit of technology out of it. So I think those are what I would take out if I had to. Thank you very much. No problem. 
Right. Those are really, really um, thoughtful answers. And uh, Ashley, if you're interested in taking this further, one thing I've learned um, this year is that it's really important when you're designing something for a group, kind of trying to build on what Julie said, um, it's important to consult that group and figure out what they're looking for and what their needs are. And um, there's lots of organizations, including public health, that work uh, with people who would really benefit from a design like this. So again, if, if you want to take this, uh, take this further, which I would really encourage you to do. Um, there are lots of groups that you can reach out to to, to get their in, um, opinions on this as well. Yeah. Um, so yes, thank you. Uh, that was, I mean, we're all very impressed. <laughs> um, so uh, I will uh, bring up uh, Krishna Sutar next. She's in grade eight. And uh, we'll just pause for a second while we bring this screen up. Thanks again, Ashley. Okay, no problem, bye. Um, hi, I'm Krishna, and this is my project on nuclear power. Introduction. Nuclear power is the use of nuclear reactions. Nuclear power can be obtained through nuclear fission and nuclear fusion reactions, or a hybrid of the two. My hypothesis is that nuclear power is better than any other types of sustainable energy and non-renewable energy sources, such as solar, wind, and hydro. And beside the text box, I have a picture of a nuclear power plant. The benefits and risks of nuclear power. Some of the benefits include less carbon dioxide emissions, more reliable than other clean energy sources. It generates constant electricity and nuclear power has a lower upfront cost and causes less deaths than other nuclear energy sources. Some of the risks include radioactive nuclear waste, but this can be eliminated when using nuclear fusion and uh, accidents like Fukushima and Chernobyl, but these are really rare and won't happen on a daily basis. And in the corner, I have a graph on deaths per terawatt hour for each energy source. And as you can see, nuclear has the least deaths. Renewable energy. Renewable energy sources such as solar, wind, and hydro don't emit carbon dioxide and, uh, and other greenhouse gases. It has a higher upfront cost compared to nuclear power, however. There are also many geographic limitations. For example, some places may have more sun or less. Um, so solar power may not work everywhere. Or hydropower, um, you can't do it in every single river or every single lake. And not enough energy is generated compared to nuclear power. Nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion reduces the environmental impacts for increasing world electricity demands. So the electricity demands in the world are currently increasing rapidly um, because there are more people and more people want electricity. And there's no danger of a, run of a runaway fusion reaction because as soon as something goes wrong in a fusion power plant, um, it is shut down completely and it can't cause any more damage. And Nuclear fusion does not generate long-lived radioactive products such as nuclear waste. And in the corner, I have a picture of how fusion works. So fusion bonds atoms together instead of um, fission, which separates them. 
Conclusion. Nuclear power is the best and most reliable energy source because it is the most efficient and fastest way to generate electricity compared to solar, wind, and hydro, which don't ge generate enough um, electricity because, for example, solar power, um, that doesn't work during the nighttime. It can only generate electricity during the day, and the sun doesn't always shine brightly, so it may not always work. The accidents that have happened in the past happen very rarely and are not going to happen on a daily basis. Uh, two, of the most, um, two of the most horrible accidents that have happened because of nuclear power, Fukushima and Chernobyl, they don't happen on a daily basis. They won't happen um, every day. And the accidents that do happen occasionally, they won't be as severe as the two that have happened in the past, considering we are... Um, like updating how we use nuclear power. And these accidents happened when nuclear power wasn't as developed. And this is my bibliography. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Hi, Krishna. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm going to take it over to the judges. Do we have any questions? Krishna, hi, my name is Alex. Thank you so much for your presentation. This has been very interesting to, to look at uh, nuclear power through your lens. And I really appreciate the work that you put into this uh, presentation as well as the report. Um, you, you frequently reference um, people's memory of very large nuclear environmental disasters. And in my experience, people don't tend to forget big instances like that. As a researcher and as a scientist, how would you share your information with the public in a way that eases their fears and concerns so that they see the importance of your science? Um, I feel as though like to share stuff, I could use um, social media as a good example. Um, so yeah, many people have social media and if something were to be posted on there, it would probably viral if it's really important so yeah okay. there you go thank you i can go next um great job krishna i really enjoyed um listening to your presentation and reading your report um and um the the position that you argued in your paper isn't one that we hear a lot about. And that's really interesting. And it's a really important skill to have as a scientist to look at what people are talking about and, and um, what is sometimes missing from that picture. And I, I read that um, aspect of your research really resonated with me. And so congratulations. Um, my question for you has to do with um, nuclear fusion, which you mentioned in your report and in your presentation and how um, importantly, nuclear fusion doesn't produce uh, nearly as much um, radioactive waste as nuclear fission does. Um, and I was just wondering if you could, um, that there's actually a, a, a source of uh, something uh, very close to us doing um, that, that, is un, that, care, that has fusion reactions in it, but it's not something that we've been able to do on earth. And I was just wondering if you knew what the, the, the closest big source of, of nuclear fusion was. Um, I don't know that, but I know that it's still developing and it's not as advanced as nuclear fusion, uh, fission. So yep. in the future, obviously, um, more people are going to start using fusion, considering it's a better source. For sure. And it, um, it, it turns out that, that that source of nuclear fusion is the sun. And we didn't understand how the sun shone for a really long time. And in fact, we didn't understand all about uh, everything about how the sun shone until um, a, a couple of years ago. Um, and um, the, the challenge with nuclear fusion is, and the reason why the sun is so good at it is in part because it's got a lot of hydrogen in it, um, but also in part because it's really, really hot in the center of the sun. And so you're, you're absolutely right that nuclear fusion is, a, is a, a, a really interesting possibility for solving the world's energy problems. And the challenge right now is to figure out how to do, how to make those reactions go at lower temperatures because it takes a lot of energy on the surface of the earth to make a, an experiment that reaches the temperatures that are high enough to do fusion. 
And so it's, um, your, your comment is, is very prescient and that's really at the forefront of research today in terms of how to power the world. That's it from me, congratulations again. Thank you. Hi Krishna, so I found this um, report in the, your presentation very, very interesting. I've actually worked at the Pickering nuclear power plant before. Um, so I'm usually the one sitting there saying, but nuclear is good. <laughs> so it's nice to have someone else who's saying something similar. Um, I have a couple questions uh, that people ask me a lot um, whenever I get into these discussions with them. Um, um, and and you've, you've made some claims um, that I, I think I struggle with a little bit too. Um, so for example, uh, no matter how great nuclear is, in Ontario anyway, hydro is the big winner. Um, it's clean, it's renewable, um, and comparatively speaking, it's extremely low cost. Uh, so in your presentation, you've said that it's nuclear that is the cleanest um, and that is the lowest cost. Where, where did you get, when we measure cost and when we measure clean, there's lots of different ways <laughs> that we can measure clean or cost. So I'm curious about how you looked at that in order to be able to make that kind of conclusion? Um, I looked at it like certain countries don't have as much water. Say um, Ontario, we can use hydropower because we have a lot of lakes, rivers around us that we could um, use hydropower. But countries, other countries, um, not all countries have that much water around them. And for countries like that, nuclear power would be the main energy source. Plus it generates a lot of electricity at once which mm -hmm. is very important considering the growing population. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm wondering if um, it's not so much that nuclear is cleaner than hydro, but nuclear is maybe more accessible than hydro? Yeah. Would that be a way to put it? Yes, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I think that was my main question. I don't know if anybody else has anything. No. Nope. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I thought that was super cool. Um, and I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Thanks again, Krishna. That was, uh, that was really informative and, uh, I was really excited to hear it. And, uh, as our other judges have said, it's a area of interest and that's coming up and is constantly discussed. So, um, you're, you really have the right pulse there. Thank right. you. Um, so next up we have Faith LaRue in grade eight. So we'll just pause the feed to bring them in. A study measuring how electronics and music affect the completion of schoolwork, written by Faith LaRue, grade eight, Trudell Public School, mentored by Rachel Richardson. Introduction. The premise behind this experiment is that I would measure how both listening to music and being on electronics for an increasing amount of time for each day during the first week would affect the completion time of grade level mathematics work. This idea stemmed from the research I read on neural pathways and how it can affect things like your memory. I want to study how this might affect schoolwork. The experimental, the experimental process took place during a two-week timeline, during which each day two students from grades eight and six were timed completing a mathematical worksheet according to their grade level. Background research. As mentioned in the previous 
slides, the predominant part of my research surrounded neural pathways and their effects. Originally, I became more interested in this topic because the sites that talked about how doing things like listening to music or learning a new language could help develop new neural pathways and how that can increase things like your memory and concentration. This information was found on the Globe and Mail, We Feel What We Hear, the impact of sound on our well-being. However, after more research, I discovered that quite a few sources said that the time it would take for these pathways to develop is not quick enough to have an effect for the short time period assigned for this experiment. I was unable to calculate how this would affect long-term school work with the results recorded. Experimental procedure. As mentioned earlier, two students completed four mathematics questions a day for two weeks, with different variables being slowly introduced. During the first week, is shown on this chart. Each day the time spent on electronics gradually increased as the week went on. On the first day, the participants spent an hour with no electronics before completing the questions. The second day, they spent an hour without electronics and then five minutes on electronics. Each day, it was one hour completely off any electronic device with the time on electronics steadily increasing. During the second week, each day the participants listened to a different genre of music, for example, jazz or rock music. Both volunteers listened to the same songs in an attempt to eliminate as many variables as possible. The songs chosen for each day were a certain genre that changed throughout the week and were listened to while the work was being completed. Results and discussion. The results of this experiment were very interesting. During the first week, the times were inconclusive and during the second week, the times were all raised significantly. I had hypothesized that during the first week, time to gradually increase as a response to the time on electronics also increasing, but because of the short time frame and too, many, too few questions a day, there were no obvious patterns in the data that was collected. During the second week, the times all increased from the first week. Originally, I had hypothesized that when listening to softer music like classical or instrumental would decrease the times, and with genres like rap, the times would increase. Instead, all times were increased in comparison to just some. Conclusions. In conclusion, this experiment studied the effects of both music and electronics, and if they lower or raise the time it takes to complete assigned math questions. After analyzing the data, I learned that music had a negative effect on the average times because of how distracting it is to some people. Finally, the data surrounding electronic devices was inconclusive due to the short time frame. Future recommendations. My first future recommendation would be to add more mathematics questions. The four questions assigned were incapable of showing the necessary data for conclusive results regarding the first week of testing. My second future recommendation would be to change the timeline from two to four weeks. This would account for helping to make sure that the average times are not all over the place and allow for longer times on the electronics during the first portion of the experimental process. Next, I'd find more people who are able to volunteer, like what was the original plan concerning this experiment. Since nobody volunteered, the numbers had to be reduced significantly. Finally, I'd find people with varying grades. This would allow for more diverse data to be collected. Bibliography. These are the sites with the information used in this presentation. Thank you for watching. Does anyone have any questions? Faith, that was really, really cool. I'm, uh, I'm really curious about this type of study uh, to begin with. And so, yeah, it was really awesome to see you create such a thoughtful experimental procedure and to come well with uh, future recommendations, I think. That's a really important part of being an experimentalist and a scientist in general. So well done. Um, the judges, uh, any questions? I think it's my turn to go first now. <laughs> um, so uh, good job on doing uh, a nice experimental design. It's really hard to get large sample sizes when you're stuck in COVID. <laughs> so, um, I appreciate that you you persevered even though you only had two people and you went off and you did the analysis. Um, I, you mentioned uh, some potential, what we call confounding factors. Have you heard that term before? I think I've heard it in passing. So basically when you, you have all the variables that you can definitely identify and that you know for sure that you're, you're either gonna manipulate or try to control for, but then there's all the other stuff and the other stuff is confounding factors. 
okay? And so you've already identified one, um, which is GPA, right? Like if someone is a good test taker, they're probably gonna do better no matter what, <laughs> versus someone who's not a good test taker, right? Um, so can you think of any other confounding factors that may have been present in your, in your existing experimental design? So some other factor that may have affected the results that you saw? Um, yes. I mentioned this in my report. Um, one was the age level. So I didn't mention this in my recommendations for my presentation, but I'd make it so we're all the same age level. So that that factor, the questions, I going to do the same questions instead of having to find different questions for different grade levels. Okay. Is there something in the design of the experiment itself, not so much about the individual participants. I'm, I have this idea and I'm curious if Maya, if you have the same idea, that's what I'm trying to get. <laughs> I just, I had something else to say, but I forgot it. And I thought of it while I was speaking and I forgot it again. <laughs> and I'm trying to think. Um, oh yeah, because there's one thing, I was looking at a website and it was about listening to music. Mm -hmm. how some people are more affected by the music mm -hmm. and it was generally people actually in the top half of the class that were less affected mm -hmm. so the results could be different compared to how people are grade wise which is why i add in the future recommendation have a wider variety of people cool I, would, I did not think of that one. <laughs> I will tell you what I thought of. I was thinking particularly about the screen time one. You have the amount of screen time increasing over time, but you also have the amount of practice or experience or comfort with the homework increasing over time as well, right? So the, these people, the very first day they sit down to do this, um, to do this homework and this study, this is the first time they've done it, right? And so maybe that would affect how they perform. Whereas over time, as they do it again and again and again, and they become more comfortable with it, that might affect how they perform as well. And so you've actually got two things changing simultaneously and it's hard to know for sure which one. And that was a big problem because also I can do the same type of math question every time or else, because the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. So I have to do different math questions, but inherently, doing long calculations for surface area or for circumference is going to take a lot longer than doing some order of operations questions or multiplying fractions. Great. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Which is why I want to add more questions so that you can kind of see that, okay, well, this doesn't take as long, but on average, so it'd be easier to find like the average times, like just in general, opposed to this date took five minutes, but this date took 40 seconds. Great, cool. Thank you very much. All right, do we have any other questions from our judges? Yes, and I think we're both being polite to one another and seeing <laughs> that's exactly what's happening. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh. Faith, thank you so much for your presentation. I had the pleasure of uh, reading your report as well. And I really like, um, I, as, as a researcher, I really appreciate how you talked about your limitations and how you overcame them. That is so important that we share with our colleagues, you know, what, what we couldn't achieve that we wanted to and what we would do differently if we could do it again or, or differently in the future. Um, before I was in this position, one of my jobs uh, was to help researchers writing grants. And that's really how we as researchers uh, fund who, who's in the lab with us, the experiments that we're doing, and to help us to buy the equipment that we need to, to make these things happen. One of the things that they're asking researchers now to do is to also consider sex and gender in their research. And I was just curious if you could um, postulate what, um, if you had included, you know, the difference between males and females, or girls and boys um, in your study, what might that look like? Um, I don't think the actual experimental process would change that much. But I do think that I would record it separately just to see if there are any differences. Yeah, I, I wonder, I was thinking about it of, of you know, 
I find that I can sometimes do things while I have distractions going on, whether it be music or um, electronic devices. Sometimes I don't have as much of a problem with distractions as maybe other people do. So I wonder, you know, maybe maybe gender or sorry, maybe sex in terms of females and males. Maybe maybe it's different for them. Well, I felt the same way. Like I didn't find the music very distracting, but my little sister, she found it really like more distracting. Yeah. So you're drawing on that age. Age is, a, is the, the variable here, hey? Which is why originally my plan was just to have grade eight students. That makes sense. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, I'll, I'll ask my question now. Um, so uh, congratulations on a, on a really great study design and, and execution. Um, as you were giving your presentation and I saw week one and week two, um, the, 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 the words that flashed into my head was longitudinal study. And that's a, that's a fancy word for um, designing a study where you follow people over time to try and um, uh, to, to try and investigate an effect. And um, I, I think you, you should really be congratulated for trying to carry out a longitudinal study um, because it's, it's a really powerful technique for, for trying to understand um, all sorts of different things about human behavior in particular. Um, and so I'd like to come back to, to your recommendation to, to lengthen the amount of time in your, in your longitudinal study. You recommended going from uh, two weeks to four weeks. And I just wondered if, if um, you could elaborate on, on why you think four weeks is, is the right next thing to try. Are there, are there things you think you could get out of this study in four weeks that um, maybe two weeks wasn't long enough? Um, yes, actually. Because like I said, since the questions are so different with just the one week, it's kind of hard to differentiate. Like this is a result of the electronics and this is a result of the, just the questions being a different type of question. So I think if we add another week to each week of the experiment, it'd be easier to tell the differences between the two. Yeah, and that comes back to um, one of the earlier questions about um, confounding variables and controlling for variables. The longer you do something, the more chance you have to look for effects among your participants and also to control or to try and tell the difference between um, different kinds of reactions to the experiment that you set up. So that's great, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Faith. I'm, I'm just, I'm really impressed with uh, like the complexity of this experiment and all the things you would have had to consider and, and that you did. Um, I'm also curious too, just totally for my own interest, uh, you know, maybe it takes longer when you do math with, with music, but I wonder if people enjoy the math better. And, uh, and that would be a totally different experiment, but I, I think it'd be interesting. Um, so yes, thank you again so much for uh, for presenting and uh, and answering your questions so well. That was really well done. Thank you. Um, and so we have our last presenter coming up, uh, Chrisanne Jackson in grade seven. So again, we'll pause the feed and bring them on.
Good morning, judges. I mean, good evening. My name is Kristen Jackson, and I'm 12 years of age. I attend school at Crawford Adventist Academy, and today I'll be assessing the scientific nature of solid waste and its impact on human health and the environment. Solid waste, commonly known as trash or garbage, is defined as any discarded material that is thrown away or disposed of by a person, a household, a factory, businesses, medical and educational institutions. Ontario Premier Doug Ford said that in 2016, Ontario made about 11.6 million tons of waste. 6.9 million tons of that waste came from the IC and I sector, also known as the industrial, commercial and institutional sector. The remainder came from the residential sectors. My hypothesis is yes, Solid waste can negatively affect human health and the environment, but it can be recovered to make economically viable products in the future. Now, what makes our waste so bad? Solid waste will eventually rot and will eventually give off a foul smell. This happens because when it's breaking down or rotting, it's going through a chemical process that makes such, as, such gases like methane and carbon dioxide. Solid waste produces leachate and as solid waste rots, it can cause pollution of our underground drinking water supply. Human and environmental impacts of solid waste. Let's look at the human impacts first. Heavy metals in the food chain resulting in diseases, deformities, and even death. Chronic and infectious diseases, skin and blood infections. There are multiple more, but let's look at the environmental impacts first. Well, second, degradation of water and soil quality. Greenhouse gases such as methane and carbon dioxide are released into the atmosphere and global warming. The list can go on and on. Now here are the here are the pictures showing you just how, how just showing you the impact that solid waste can have on human health and the environment. Now I came up with creative and economically viable inventions from solid waste. My first invention was a small homemade wind energy generator. My goal of making this was to make a windmill using mostly recyclable materials to create wind energy, something that could be replicated by homeowners on a larger scale. With success, there always will be problems. So I had three main problems. My first problem was I had no strong wind. My second problem was getting the rotor blade to spin fast enough to light the LED lamp. And my third problem was the parts stable, keep, keep, keeping the parts stable when the motor blade spun. With every problem, there's a solution. My first solution to my first problem was I used a blow dryer to get the strong enough wind, but the heat from the blow dryer was melting the hot glue. So I switched from hot glue to crazy glue. My second solution was I used screws in place instead of crazy glue in some areas to hold the motor in place. My third solution was I used a water bottle with stones to keep the wind generator from falling over as it spun. I also made a tail of wood and plastic caps. My second invention that I made from waste materials was a stationary holder made from toilet paper rolls and cardboard, a stationary holder made from tin cans and a gift bag. My fourth invention was a decorative floral pot made from a tin can, magazine sheets, and newspaper. My fifth invention, last but not least, was a handbag slash purse made from a plastic slash cardboard wig box. Solid waste, if not properly managed, can become harmful, toxic, and even deadly to human health and the environment. Heavy metals in leachate and greenhouse gases caused from, are caused from, caused from rotting waste can have deadly impact on human health and the environment. This tells me and shows me that my hypothesis was correct.
Now, if we start seeing solid waste as a resource, less waste would go to the landfill. There would be less pollution of the air, water, and land, and more waste materials would be reused to make new products. The products I have made, as well as the invention of the small homemade windmill, shows that waste materials can be recovered and made into economically viable and marketable products. Thank you for listening. Hi, Kristen. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I just think it's I think it's super cool that you took an idea of recycling and really made it into reusing and repurposing materials. Uh, that's, you know, a really big shift in, in how to think about waste. And uh, I'm really impressed. Um, so I'll take it on. I'll let the judges ask you some questions. Okay. Can I go first this time? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Let me turn my video on. Um, really great job. I enjoyed your presentation and I thought it was uh, a, a really um, uh, creative use of uh, things that we typically don't think very much about. And I thought that the, just the number of inventions that you came up with was really impressive. So congratulations. Um, as you highlighted in your presentation, waste is a, is a big problem and, and we generate a lot of it. And so in thinking about how to um, use solid waste effectively, are there particular um, parts of that solid waste that you would prioritize over others? Are there particular things that we should be getting out of our landfills more quickly than others and therefore prioritize um, inventing with them? What do you think about that? I mean, I would say for a fact that they're all important, but of course you have to prioritize prioritize because especially the way leachate's made is when the organic materials or solid waste is rotting and any form of moisture touches it. So I think it'd be best to keep and try to keep the compost out of the landfill as much as possible. So that's a great suggestion. Is um, in the city that you live, are there are there initiatives to try and encourage people to 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 take compost out of the regular garbage stream yet? That's something um, that um, where I live is just starting. Yeah, um, I haven't heard of it yet, but um, the um, government has come up with a zero waste plan, where you try to limit as much as possible waste going to the landfills. So, yeah, wonderful. Thanks and congratulations. Thank you. I'd like to ask a follow-up question about that, <laughs> about food waste. Um, so your project has done a really great job of focusing on potential um, reuse of items, but none of the items that you looked at are food waste items because reusing food waste is kind of gross, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so have you thought about how, so the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle, right? You talked a yes. little bit about recycling and you talked, you talked some about um, reuse. How could we maybe reduce the amount of food waste that goes into the system in the first place? Do you have any thoughts on that? I know, I know it's an extension, right? Like it do wasn't you mean like, Do you mean like when you throw out, throw them out, like try to prevent them from going to the landfill? I'm, I'm talking about like prevent it from being garbage in the first place. That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, it's a real extension. So, do you, mean, do you mean for like plastics? No, I mean like you know. Do you know in your research? Did you find out how much food goes into the dumpster before it even gets to households or restaurants? No. So I there's just, a, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's it's a lot. Yeah, so that's what I'm wondering about. Do you have any creative ideas there for the compost? Sure. Oh, um, maybe you put them in the ground, maybe like dig a hole in your backyard and put them in the, put the recycling, oh, not the recycling, put the compost in the ground and bury it. Or you could just leave it on your grass and let it break down. Okay, cool. Thank you. Oh, I'm here. Chris Ann, thank you so much for your presentation. I think you have some brilliant ideas and quite frankly, I would love to have seen all like 
see the products that you made, not just the windmill, but I, I love that you included photos and that you experimented with lots of different ideas. That's super cool. I can see that you're very innovative and that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've been thinking about since reading your report is um, I really like that you made this like a, a Canada, um, you know, looking at the, the Toronto dump site and how big it is in comparison to others that's super relevant and local to us. I was thinking though about, and I don't know if you've heard about this, but the giant waste island that is floating around in the ocean and how much plastics and things that don't really break down well are just out there now floating around altogether. Have you heard of that before? No, I actually haven't. It, it's incredible in that it's, it's an island that's bigger than some provinces. I think it's actually bigger than the state of Texas, if I'm not mistaken, now in the uh, wow. now out in the ocean. So um, I was curious, by extension too, if um, now that you know about the garbage island that exists in the ocean, what do you think you could do with your project to help reduce the waste that's out there that isn't just in one country, but it's the responsibility of the entire world? I think for the plastics, you could like maybe, you know, butter containers, like how mm -hmm. when you're done with the butter, when you're done with the butter, maybe you could like wash it out and reuse it for something. Maybe you don't have to go to the store and buy another, another container to bring your food in. Maybe you could just bring your food in that. So I, I like that you're you're thinking about a campaign for reusing before we toss it out. Yes. That's great. Good for you. Thanks, Chrisanne. You're welcome. All right. Thank you again, Chrisanne. That was that was really wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we've heard from all of our finalists. Um, and uh, again, just a big broad thank you. That was really educational for me and uh and i think it stirred up a lot of good discussion amongst our judges as well and i hope you found it valuable to be able to present your ideas and have some feedback from our judges um i do think though that that feedback from your peers can sometimes be just if not more valuable to you because they they speak your same language they've now gone through the same struggles that you have so i would really encourage you um to take a moment reflect on these presentations, write things down, things that you noticed that were really exciting or that maybe you would try next time. Um, and you can send those to Steph and she'll distribute them out to uh, all the relevant people. And you can make it anonymous. You don't, you don't need to tell people who you are. Okay, um, okay so we're gonna uh, close this feed down for a little while for our judges to deliberate. I'd have all of the finalists join the meet and greet Zoom um, while our judges are deliberating. And we'll join back here uh, I mean, tune in to the live stream on YouTube, sorry, at uh, 3.20 so that we can announce the winners. Um, and again, congratulations. You all did a really, really fantastic job.
So welcome back. Thanks again for, for joining us uh, to find out the winner of the science fair. Um, but I really wanted to preface this with um, the fact that although there are winners and there's some sort of numerical value here, uh, you all did a fantastic job and you should all be proud of the work um, that you put into an independent project where you thought critically, you were creative, and you were able to effectively communicate your ideas and your solutions to us. So um, you should all be really, really proud of the work you put into this and, uh, and the projects you were able to produce. Um, I would also encourage you, if you're still curious and you want to add some of the, the future directions you mentioned, that you should keep working on these things. Um, you know, science never ends, and, uh, and you all you all seem like lifelong learners. And uh, so I'm, I'm really encouraged to see what you put together here. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I will announce the uh, third place. So thir third place is going to Chrisanne Jackson. And we felt that her ability to problem solve and to be able to build all of, of the solutions she came up with was incredibly impressive. So congratulations, you're gonna have a year long subscription to National Geographic. Um, in second place, we have Faith LaRue. Um, we felt that her communication and ability to think critically through her uh, experimental design was very, very impressive. Um, so you are going to be able to take away a learn to code robot kit. Um, and we will, of course, we'll be in touch with all of our uh, winners uh, about how these prizes will be arriving to you. Um, and finally, uh, our first place finalist is uh, Ashley Cunningham. Um, and we were just really impressed with her depth of knowledge on her topic and her ability to think through the questions that were presented. Um, and just overall, yeah, a really, really wonderful job. Um, do any of our judges have anything you want to say before we, we close off here? I just want to say congratulations again. And also, um, thank you very much for involving me in this process. Uh, it was a wonderful opportunity to see some of the amazing things that some of our uh, young women are working on. And I, as I said at the very beginning of this, and now even more, I cannot wait to see what all of you are going to do with your, with your science and your engineering and your excellent thinking in the future. Yeah, for me, this is this was a great afternoon. Thank you so much for including me. I really enjoyed listening to all of you. And please keep in mind, you're you're all superstars. This was so great. Every single project was just awesome. And so so keep at it. Um, keep uh, you know keep following your interests and following through on your passions. And um, there's uh, there's a lot of women in science and engineering. And uh, we're, you guys are are just really bright stars. And it was a real fun afternoon. Thanks. I echo my colleagues. Congratulations to all of the participants, to the individuals who have also run the science fair. This has been really awesome to be a part of. I am so inspired and invigorated by all of your ingenuity, as well as your intelligence. I cannot wait to see you all at university one day or off in your careers, because I think you're going to be doing wonderful things in the future. So wonderful to meet you all. Congratulations and best of luck in the future. All right, with that, I think we'll close. So again, thank you to all of our participants and to our finalists today for coming out. Thank you to our judges for volunteering your time and for asking such thought-provoking questions. Um, and uh, please check back on our Girls Initiative Online Science Fair webpage and we'll be, um, we'll be able to put up any of the deliverables that came out of these projects like the pamphlet, um, and maybe any designs that you, uh, if you want to share, um, we'll, we'll make that available on there. All right. Thanks again so much and take care, everyone.